Um, you and this to, is, yeah. So. No, sorry, I was going to shift, but um, you know, when you think about the importance of going to Mars versus solving critical energy and climate change problems here on Earth, obviously the effort with Tesla is related to sustainable energy. And I think going back to like probably the 1950s, there were engineering designs around plasma fusion or fusion-based systems that have evolved to these plasma systems, to these tokamak systems. And every year, every decade, it's like, hey, next decade, we're going to have it. What's your point of view on where plasma fusion systems are? Are we going to have fusion energy this century, this decade? And does it create limitless energy where the uh, electricity production goes up by 10,000 fold and the price of electricity drops by 10,000 fold? And then what does that world on Earth look like if that happens? So I guess the question is like, is that technology real? When does it happen and what happens to the world here when and if that happens? I'll answer that question, but then I'll, I'll, I'll let, let me sort of point out what the what the actual issue is. Uh, if the question is like, uh, is it possible to solve uh, fusion energy? Uh, One hundred percent, yes, definitely, 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 is for sure. Um, so the, the the and 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 really just using a tokamak style, which is like a, basically a donut ring with uh, uh, with electromagnets that control the the the, the plasma. Uh, the, the way to solve that is simply scale up the tokamak. Uh, fusion is uh, very much a scale-based uh, uh, thing. You want to minimize your surface-to-volume ratio. So as you scale up, up uh, a tokamak, you reduce your surface-to-volume ratio, which means like the, 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 the volume you have relative to the, the, the surface, uh, you, you, you now have much more... Uh, like you, you can basically have a hot zone in the center that's relatively far away from the walls and, and, and more of a hot zone. Um, so the the so it's it's not in my mind a question as to whether fusion can work, but there is a question as to whether it is economically viable, um, and and whether it is competitive with uh, with with alternatives. I think the the economic viability of fusion is a, a much bigger question, and I I think the answer probably is that uh, a fusion uh, Earth if fusion is not competitive economically. I think that is that is a uh, I would say it's probably not competitive economically by an order of magnitude. Where does, uh, it break, where does it break? Is it a materials breakdown or where does it break down economically? Well, so, so you can't just um, use uh, normal hydrogen. You know, you, you need to right. use like deuterium and tritium, like unusual forms of hydrogen. Helium-3. Yeah. Helium-3. Uh, uh, you know, there, um, there are some... Uh, some uh, other types of, of fusion that could be used, uh, but um, th these are just not, they're, they're not like, uh, there's not a lot of this raw material. It's quite difficult to get the raw material. So first you have to get the raw material. Uh, that's that's very, so ex expensive raw material. Um, and then um, it's not just about generating the, the, the energy. You've, you've got to um, turn that energy into usable electricity. You can't just have a hot thing. Okay, so the hot thing has to translate to usable electricity. So I think you've got a, you've got a cost of a fuel issue, which is very significant. Uh, you've got you got to have a whole bunch of knockdowns from uh, when you generate the heat to uh, when you actually convert that into electricity. Um, you've got some very difficult maintenance issues with with a, a fusion reactor. Um, so, uh, and, and that should be then compared to alternatives. Uh, the, the, the sustainable energy alternatives that I think uh, are overwhelmingly more competitive are um, uh, solar energy, wind, uh, geothermal, uh, hydro, uh, some tidal and energy, but it's really primarily uh, solar uh, and, and wind. Um, now, and you can really th say, like, what, 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 why bother creating uh, fusion on Earth when we have a gigantic fusion reactor in the sky that just works with zero maintenance? And it right. shows up every day. Right. And it's free. Pretty consistent. Yeah. But Elon, yeah. can we scale to 1,000x or 100x our electricity production here using solar and other renewable yeah. sources? Yes. So the, the, the amount of uh, surface area you need to uh, power the United States is remarkably tiny. Um, so you need like basically roughly 100 miles by 100 miles of territory. And it obviously doesn't need to be in one place uh, in the United States to power the United States. It's like a little corner of Texas or Utah, the entire country. Um, and, and then if you, if you, if you, 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 could, you could basically 
power, uh, you, you probably 10x the, the, just with solar alone, um, without displacing uh, anyone's home, uh, power an economy 10 times the size of the United States in the United States on land. When, when, when energy now, prices... If you, extend that to, if, you extend that, if you extend that to water, because Earth is 70% water, yeah. I, I mean, you could, you could say, okay, now we could probably have a civilization that is 100 times as energy intensive as we currently have it. And so what, what does that look like was the last part of my question, which is a world where energy costs are, say, let's 100 times cheaper than they are today, and we have 100 times more energy production capacity. What, what, what changes about civilization? What do we do differently? And what do we see change most kind of dramatically? Well, currently, we're, we're not, because of, of just generally uh, low birth rates almost worldwide, uh, civilization is not headed to uh, have a population that is an order of magnitude greater than where, where we're, we're currently. We're currently headed towards a population decline. Uh, and this is almost everywhere in, world, in the world. Um, so, you know, it basically seems as, as though as soon as you have like urbanization um, and, and, and education beyond a certain level and income beyond a certain level, birth rates plummet. Um, and so as countries get, get wealthier, their birth rates plummet. It's, it's somewhat counterintuitive because people will say like, well, it's too expensive to have a baby. Nope. The, the wealthier you are, the, are, the fewer kids you have. Um, the more educated you are, the fewer kids you have. So um it's it's uh, it's it's the, it's the inverse um so so i'm not sure who would use all that energy um unless there's a, a significant change in the birth rate um or we have a very robot oriented economy so that's also possible so if we've got a lot of um you know four-wheeled robots in form of cars and uh, androids uh, so humanoid robots then you could certainly see that there'd be perhaps a need for an order of magnitude more energy. But it's not coming from the humans un unless something major changes on the, on the human uh, birth rate uh, level. Uh, th this, by the way, is I think the biggest single threat to civilization uh, right now is the... Yeah, why, why do you think societally people just make those decisions when they become more affluent? Is it that they just become more selfish or there's more things for them to do and they have more money to spend on themselves and they say, you know what? I don't want to have a large family. I want to, you know, go to Coachella. Yeah. Well, uh, th there is this like weird, like mind virusy thing where some people are think like having fewer kids is is like better for the environment. Yeah, this that's is, crazy. This is total nonsense. Nonsense. Uh, the, the environment is going to be fine. They're going to be fine even if we if we doubled the, the size of the humans. Um, this is, and I know a lot about environmental stuff. So, um, you know. Uh, you, the, we, we can't have civilization just dwindle into nothing. Um, and, you know, Japan's leading indicator here, like the Japan's population declined by 600,000 people last year. They had the lowest birth rate in history. Uh, it's, you know, it's pretty bad. Um, so we, I don't know. We, we, and I think so, so, so this one element of it is, is, is a, a lot of people just think that having kids is, is somehow bad for the environment. I want to be clear, it's not. It's essential for, maintain, for maintaining civilization that we at least maintain our numbers. We don't necessarily need to grow dramatically, but at least let's not uh, you know, gradually dwindle away and, until uh, civilization ends with us all in adult diapers and, 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 and in a whimper. Like we don't want civilization to end in a, adult diapers with a whimper. That would suck. <laughs> kind of suck, yeah. yeah. Bleak. Bleak and sad. Well, I mean, and, and you and I have had this conversation. I mean, in, in Japan, I had two people tell me when I was there, like, I, I think it's immoral to bring humans into the world. I mean, people have gotten very yeah. sad about the future. It's kind of crazy. The world's great. Life's yes. awesome. Yes. No, there's, there's literally, I've heard many times, how, like, how can I bring a child into this terrible world? I'm like, have you read history? Because let me tell you, it was way worse back then. Okay. Yeah. Now is a good time. Now is a good time to be <laughs> yeah. bored. Hey, yeah. you know, listen, I, I know you're super busy, but I wanted to ask you about the move to Texas because I've been thinking about it. Uh, Austin, California, uh, I, I don't know, some senator told you to go fuck yourself and, like, you know, like, we don't yeah, need you. I think here. there's been a couple senators who said that, actually. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to be turning into a bit of a trend. Um, but how has building the Tesla um, Gigafactory, which I got to see in Austin a couple of weeks ago, and it was one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen. I mean, it, 
I don't know how many months it took to build there, but how long did it take to build that dreadnought? And then what would it have taken to build that in California, California under Gavin Newsom? So we, we built the, 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 the Giga Texas, which is the biggest factory in North America, I think possibly the biggest factory in the world. Um, and it's, it's three times the size of the Pentagon to give you a sense of scale. Okay, so this is friggin' big. It's like, it's weird. It's like so big, it's weird. Like you, it's like- I, I was trying to find you in it and it, I was trying to drive around and it took me about 45 minutes to find you. <laughs> yeah, like, no, you have to like call, you can't like find someone in the building. You have to call them on their cell phone and say, where are you, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, the building is like uh, uh, just under a mile long and we're actually gonna extend it. It will be like literally a mile long um, and about a quarter mile wide. Uh, and it's uh, 80 feet tall. So it's just uh, ridiculously big. Um, and when you think about it, like for a manufacturing situation, like what, what, what are the two, the two things that really define manufacturing competitiveness are economies of scale and technology. And so if you've got an ACE on economy, like you, if you sort of maximize your, your ACE level on, on technology and you maximize your ACE level on scale, this is obviously going to be the most competitive situation. And that's why they're so friggin' giant. Um, and the, 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 a Giga Texas will go all the way from um, cell raw materials, like, like, like basically rail cars of cell raw materials coming in and then forming the, the battery cell, then the battery pack, uh, building the, the, the motor, uh, casting. We also have introduced a major innovation, which is to cast the entire uh, front third and rear third of the car in, as a single piece. Um, I got this idea from toys, actually, because I was like, how do they make toys? Those are cheap. They just cast them. I was like, well, can you build a casting machine that big? And they're like, well, no one ever has. I'm like, Is there, are we breaking physics? Like, no. Well, let's just ask them. And there were six major casting machine suppliers in the world, and five of them said no, and the sixth said maybe. I'm like, I'll take that as a yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this, you wanted to do this for the Model 3, but it was just too soon, huh? Uh, and, and now it's almost there. Yeah, actually, this, this partly comes from the Model 3, which is actually a fantastic car in many ways. Um, um, but we were rightly criticized for an inefficient design uh, with, for the front and rear body. Um, uh, like Sandy Monroe, who I think is really ex has excellent from an engineering standpoint and, and really a very fair critic, uh, <laughs> he, he pistol whipped us for um, the design of the, of the battery. He, he ripped was like, it apart uh, and piece by piece told you why you suck. Yeah. And then he did the why yes. and told you why you were awesome. He, he took it apart and told us exactly why, he, why we sucked. And he was correct. Um, yeah. And then <laughs> and I was like, well, that's pretty embarrassing. So, uh, no, there, there, he was complimentary of other parts of the car, but not the body yeah. design. And, uh, and so it's like, okay, we're going to go from like, you know, uh, the, the, it's, it's just an incredibly difficult body to make. It's made out of like 120 different pieces with dissimilar metals that are joined and you've got galvanic corrosion challenges. So got, it's, it's very difficult to make um, to a single piece casting. That's one piece. So like 120 pieces went down to like one. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge, and, and the, the, like the Model Y body shop, especially the new one where we cast both the front and rear is 60% smaller than the Model 3 body shop. So it's, it's, you know, gigantic. Uh, it's quite a, there's, there's a lot of innovations of Tesla besides the stuff that is, is obvious. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so yeah, the, the but if, <laughs> and, and really, you know, to, to, be, to be fair to, to, to Gavin Newsom, like, uh, the, you know, if, if, you, <laughs> if, if you had a gun to Gavin's head, okay, um, and said, we need to build, start building this factory in California right now, he couldn't do it because there are so many... Uh, regulatory agencies um, and so many uh, litigators in California that want to stop you from doing anything that even if you're the governor of the, of the state, you cannot get it done. Um, so something's got to be done to, 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 to you know, because California used to be the land of opportunity and it's a beautiful state. And I love, I loved living there. I still spend a lot of time in California, even though every time I go there, I get the, every, literally every day I go there, I get the bejesus tax big out of tax, me. Big I, tax bill by day. Yeah, like the sheer cost per day of me going and working in California days boggles the mind. And I, but I still do it, you know, um, but, but it, it, the, the California's gone from the land of opportunity to, to the land of, of, of sort of taxes, uh, overregulation and litigation. And th this is not a good situation. And really, this has got to be like a, a, a serious cleaning out of the pipes in California. How many months was it to get 
uh, the, the gig of Austin done? Took a year and a half, two years? How yeah, 18, 18 months to build something three times the size of the Pentagon. Incredible. And you just basically, the answer to how many months it would take in California oh. is infinity. No, we, we, would, we would still be working on the permits. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Elon, this, this begs a good question, which is, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Can you yeah. keep signing paperwork? <laughs> but what, we have one what, more form for you. <laughs> what's a better model? <laughs> yes. What's a better model for government? So, you know, like all governments tend to increase in complexity. Dictatorship. Capacity. <laughs> is, this, is the dictatorship the right model? <laughs> and, um, you know, like, like how do we solve this? Let's say you go to Mars or let's say you have to fix California. Is California permanently broken? Is there a way to fix it? Or like, how do you set up a better model? So that you don't end up having this this kind of special interest complexity situation that eventually kills the uh, population. Well, I mean, I think ultimately with California, the, the people of California just have to get fed up and and demand change. Um, that's the thing that really has to happen. Um, and 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 there's got, there's got to be an above zero percent chance of the of the Republicans winning in California. If 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 it's if it's just the, the Democrats every time, it's got to be. Yeah. You know, and this is this is like occasionally it, 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 the, the thing is that right right now, uh, you, 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 it, and plus the level of level of gerrymandering, uh, which is basically just treat, treating the people like sheep uh, and, and uh, it's, it's terrible. Um, it, it, that's gone on in California is outrageous. So California, uh, the Dems have a super majority in, in um, the House and Senate in California and the governor and everything. And so how responsive is any political party going to be to the people if they are uh, guaranteed to win? It's, it's a one party state. Yeah. And so uh, I'm not saying that, you know, go in, 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 sort of elect the Republicans every time, but if it's never you're, you're just making California a one-party state. They will no longer be responsive, responsive to the people and will only be responsive to those that funded their political campaigns. Clip Elon saying that 30 seconds on TV over and over. <laughs> Go ahead, Sex. Yeah. So, uh, Elon, shifting gears to the economy, um, you know, we saw this uh, surprise report of negative 1.4% GDP growth in Q1. Uh, interest rates have been rising. That increased the cost of the consumer of getting loans, things like that. Uh, we've had a stock market correction, really a crash in uh, a lot of growth stocks, software stocks. Um, what, from where you sit and the data that you see, uh, where, where do you think the economy is, is headed right now? Do you think we're in a recession or is it just a risk? How do you, how do you assess our current economic situation? Well, predicting economic, macroeconomics is always difficult um, and, and one should assign probabilities to these things. Um, but ironically, I did last year, people asked me what I think about the economy. I said, well, I, I think we might enter a recession in approximately uh, uh, spring of, of, 2020, of 2022. <laughs> Called it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so uh, I, you know, now the thing is that recessions are not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, they, they, you know, um, what, what it, I've now been through a few of them, and what, what tends to happen is if you, if you have um, a, a boom for, that goes on for too long, you get misallocation of capital. Uh, it starts raining money on fools, basically. It's like any any dumb thing gets money, and I'm sure you've seen a few of those. Um, so at, 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 at some point, it gets just out of control, and you just have a misallocation of, of human capital, uh, where, where people are doing things that are silly and, and not useful to their fellow human beings. Um, and, and, and then those companies, there needs to be sort of an economic enema, if you will, um, uh, to, to have everyone sort of shift uncomfortably in their seats. Um, so, <laughs> but, but the, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just I'm visualizing it, the economic enema. <laughs> it, I mean, listen, it's got alliteration. Um, so, uh, <laughs> this too shall pass. <laughs> this too shall pass. Eventually, the economic enema does its job. It clears out the pipes, if you will. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and 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 sort of the the, the, the bullshit companies um, uh, go bankrupt, and the ones that are doing useful products uh, are prosperous. Um, and um, but but there's certainly a lesson here that if one is making useful product and 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 do it, do, has a company that makes sense, uh, make sure you're not running things too close to the edge from a capital standpoint. They've got some capital reserves to uh, last through uh, irrational times. Because in the in the past, when there's been a recession, um, it has gone. It's it's amazing. It's flipped like a light switch. I mean, David, do you remember this when from the from the PayPal you know ex PayPal days when when we uh, raised hundred million dollars in March of two thousand. 
uh, and, and we literally, we had, the, the demand was so high, we had uh, people like VCs, like just literally without even a term sheet, wiring money into our account. Um, <laughs> we'll send the term sheet later. <laughs> they, they literally were like, were like sleuth out our, our bank account number and wire money in. And we're like, where did this come from? And it's like, <laughs> oh, they, <laughs> um, they, so it was like, they were literally fire hosing money in March of 2000. And, and then in April 2000, the market went into free fall and it went from money, raising money was trivial to even good companies could not raise money uh, in, in a month. Um, so it's just important to bear in mind like that, you know, PayPal almost went bankrupt in, in 2000, uh, we came close. Um, but, but thankfully, we'd, we'd raised that, that $100 million in, in March 2000, uh, without which we'd be in, uh, we'd be in game over, basically. Um, uh, and, and we kind of saw it coming. So it's like we, we, we got that, the, the, the X-Confinity merger done in like three weeks and raised $100 million. <laughs> because we were all like, uh-oh, how, this is, we, we see this coming to an end pretty soon. And then a month later, it was like, it, you know, a nightmare, basically. Um, and and uh, anyway, so it's just important to make sure if you're a healthy company, you've got some capital to get through things. Um, and, and and then what, what's your costs? And uh, if, you, if, if, if it is a recession, which... It, more likely than not, it is a recession. I'm not saying it is, but it, pro it probably is. Um, then just uh, make watch your cash flow and, and get to positive cash flow as soon as you can. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, but I, I think we probably are the, the, are in a recession, and that that recession will get get worse. Um, but you know, it, these things pass, and then there will be boom times again. Um, so it'll probably be some, some tough going for, I don't know, a year, uh, maybe, maybe, you know, 12 to 18 months is usually, um, the, the amount of time that it takes for, for the, a correction to, to happen. Um, right. I mean, what do you guys think? Yeah. Hey, David, uh, how do you feel about it? Yeah. I mean, it feels like it started, um, you know, what started as a slowdown earlier this year um, now seems like, I mean, technically, I guess we need two quarters of negative growth to be in a recession, but it feels like we're in one. It feels like it started. Yeah. Um, you know, the growth stock, the software businesses that we invest in are sort of the canaries in the coal mine. And there's a lot of, a lot of dead canaries. <laughs> not dead, but... Uh, they're having a hard time breathing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not dead yet! <laughs> It's, it's, not, it's not dead. It's, it's just it's just napping. It's, it's <laughs> napping. Wake up, little birdie. <laughs> Wake up. We made it's, it. high. it's just it's, high. It's just stunned. It's it's got, it got stunned for a brief moment, and 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 it just it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> it, it, it sort of reminds me of the the, the parrot, the, you know, the pet shop sketch with the parrot with Monty yes, Python. Yes, Monty Python. Um, where, yeah. <laughs> it's pining. This parrot is pining for the fjords. <laughs> hey, um, Elon, a lot has been talked about as we wrap here, and you've been incredibly gracious giving us so much time. Thank you for that. Um, a lot of talk about American exceptionalism over the last couple of years um, waning, and maybe this country had seen its best days. And uh, we see the work you're doing and other people in this great country are doing and the debates we're having about the future. And uh, yeah, China's doing pretty fantastic. Russia's on the ropes. Um, but it does seem like uh, America is still producing s some of the greatest companies uh, the world has ever seen, some of the greatest innovations. What are your thoughts on America and our future and what we need to keep this country and, and this beacon of hope that, you know, four of the five of us were not born here? You know, two of you came from South Africa. And no, three of you. Three of you came from South Africa and one of you from Canada. I don't know what they're putting in the Oh, world. from Sri Lanka. And from Sri Lanka and through Canada. Via Canada. Via Canada. <laughs> he came through Canada too. Yeah, I know. It, it seems like that's the, that's the way. Canada is a gateway. It is a gateway. <laughs> and and how, how do we, it's a, well, I'm, I'm hinting at the answer here, but you know, it, it does seem like our immigration policy is absolutely insane. And uh, maybe we need to keep collecting some of the great individuals that I get, I get to share the stage with here and yourself. We need to keep bringing great people to this country. Why yeah. can't we get that in our heads that yeah. it's not immigration, it, it, it's, it's talent recruitment? No, absolutely. I think uh, it's incredibly important that the United States be like the destination for the world's best talent. I mean, you can think of this like, like, the, like a pro sports team. If you want to win the league, 
Um, and and uh, you, you know you, you want the best players in your team. Um, there, now there are obviously a, a lot of a, a very talented people born in the United States. Um, but if you could add a few aces from uh, from uh, outside the country to the team, you're going to win the league. Um, and 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 here's the thing: those aces actually want to work for your team. They don't want to compete against you. They want to. They want to win. They want to be on Team America. And and so it's like we we have to like fight them off to not be on Team America. That's the crazy thing. Um, and so it's like if you had some aces that that are the difference between winning and losing, we should be like really recruiting them like you'd recruit like a star basketball player or football player that's what you should, we should be doing um active recruiting um just like if you're a company that wants wants to succeed you actively recruit the best talent and then and and, and that, that's the way to win and and if if that stops happening america will stop winning and we have two administrations in a row biden and trump who don't want to let the greatest minds, the most talented people into this country is absolutely insane. I mean, I think you deal the, with this every day. Yeah, right? I mean, I think the reality, reality is like actually any, anyone who who's going to who wants to, to to work hard and be and, and do useful things, um, and and this you know uh, we we want in the United States, um, and, and it's not just people who are sort of intellectually strong, but it's just anyone with a, with a strong work ethic. You know, if if they're coming from Mexico or if they're coming from you know Europe or China, wherever, it's just if if they're like going to come here and crank hard and 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 contribute more than they take, hell yeah! I mean, that's just it's a no brainer. We, you, uh, have you been have you been disappointed in the similarities between Biden and Trump on this? Like maybe you could have expected it from Trump because that was the rhetoric he needed to use to get elected. But it's not as if Biden has flipped the script and said, OK, we're going to go 180 degrees in the other direction. He's kind of kept it the same, which has been really surprising, actually. Man, it's hard to tell what Biden's doing, if you're totally frank. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, I feel like it's the, weekend the, at Bernie's. The, 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 the real president is whoever controls the teleprompter, you know. It's like it's like the, 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 the path to power is the path to the teleprompter, you know, like what because what, that then he just reads the teleprompter. So, you know, I, I do feel like, like if, if somebody would accidentally lead on the lean on the teleprompter, it's going to be like Anchorman. It's going to be like QQQ ASDF one, two, three, you know, type of thing. Um, <laughs> I mean, in fairness to Biden, he, he hasn't been napping as much as he needs to, but <laughs> well, it's, 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 just, it's, it's hard to say hard like job. I mean, things just... that are getting done, you know, it, th th this, I mean, this administration just, just, it doesn't seem to get a lot done. Like, and, you know, um, whatever, like the, the Trump administration, leaving Trump aside, I, th there were a lot of people in the administration who were effective at getting things done. So, uh, but this, this administration seems just just to not have like the drive to just get shit done. Uh, that that um, that that's my it's it's that's my impression. Um, so, um, you know, we definitely need to fix immigration policy. Like we had COVID, which was an issue, and 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 so that was like one reason to like not you know I guess clamp down on. But now let's, now we moved on, and so let, let's let's just make sure we're we're getting tough talent. Uh, in the United States, um, and, and, and really, I'd say broadly, it's anyone who who wants to work their ass off um, and and uh, and contribute more than they take to the economy. Like that's just necessarily going to make for a stronger, better society in America. Elon, did you see uh, Jeff's uh, Bezos's tweet back and forth with Biden, um, where Biden, I think, was talking about inflation, inflation, but then he correlated that to taxing corporations. And Bezos said, "This is misinformation and disinformation, et cetera, et cetera." What do you What do you think about that whole exchange? Then back and forth. I mean, the the obvious reason for inflation is that the government printed a zillion amount of more money than it had, uh, obviously. Um, so it's it's like the government can't just uh, uh, you know have. Um, issue checks far in excess of revenue without there being inflation, um, you know, velocity of money held constant. So unless there's something would, would change with velocity of money, but, but, but it, it just, look, the, the, if the federal government writes checks, they don't, they never bounce. So that is effectively creation of more, of more dollars. And if, if there are more dollars created than the increase in the goods and services output of the economy, then you have inflation again, velocity of money held constant. Um, but so, uh, 
this is just this is very basic. Uh, this is not like uh, you, you know uh, super complicated. Um, and and if, if if the government could just issue uh, m- massive amounts of money and have a, and, and deficits didn't matter, then well, why don't we just make the deficit a hundred times bigger? Okay, yeah. and the answer right. is you can't because it, it will basically turn the dollar into something that is worthless. So. Um, and, and various countries have have tried this experiment multiple times. It's not like, oh, I wonder what happens if this if if, if this is done. Yeah. Have you seen Venezuela? Like the the poor people of Venezuela are, you know, have been just run roughshod by their government. Um, and so obviously you can't simply uh, create money. The, the 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 true economy is very important. Like the true economy is the output of goods and services. It's not money. It's it's literally. What is the output of goods and services? Money is simply a way to, to for us to, or anything that you call money, uh, is, is a way for us to conveniently exchange goods and services without having to engage in barter, and also to shift obligations in time. That those are the two reasons that you have money. Uh, this thing called money. It's it's really a, it's a database. Like money is a, is an is an information system for uh, for labor allocation and for exchange of goods and services and for translating in time. Um, and the quality of that information is a function of, it's, it's like you basically you can apply information theory to money. And, and I think it, it, it helps explain why one money system is, or why, why one action is better than another. And so if like the, 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 you, you, you just, just like a, an internet connection, you'd want something that's high bandwidth, uh, low latency and jitter, and uh, is not dropping packets, does not have a lot of errors in the system. Um, and the same is true true of money. Um, you, you, you want, and, that, and, and really, like you said, like, what, what did PayPal really really do that it helped improve the the the, the bandwidth, the, the speed at which money could move? Um, instead of of mailing checks back and forth, which amazingly that was what people did uh, in in two thousand, um, uh, you you can now do real time exchange of of money, um, and and now you could ship your goods immediately instead of mailing a check. And waiting for the, the bank to clear the check. So, uh, like, and and the the ultimate thing that with PayPal, or if, or if it sort of was in the X.com, sort of went, went more less sort of niche payments, and more sort of broad financial would be to simply just that it uh, doesn't to mediate all the heterogeneous uh, COBOL databases out there running on mainframes doing batch yeah. processing, and have a single real time system that uh, that was secure um, and not batch processing, um, and so. It would, just, it would just be from an information standpoint more efficient, and and eventually it would all the the batch processing COBOL mainframes operated by the banks would cease to exist. You've um, spent more time uh, and uh, built more in China than almost anybody. I mean, Apple would be the only company I could think of that's probably got a bigger footprint, but I'm not certain of that. Um, what have you learned about China uh, that you didn't know before you opened the factories there and started uh, delivering cars there? And what should we know about China, you know, as Americans? How should we think about China and our relationship with it? Because we haven't spent time there. Sure. Well, I'd say like China, first of all, is not monolithic. It's not like uh, everything, everything is not some plot by the Chinese government. Um, the, uh, the, 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 there are many uh, factions within China that compete uh, vigorously within China. Um, and uh, so, um, and, 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 the, and, and, Perhaps most important is that there's just a, a, a just a tremendous number of hardworking, smart people in China who want to get ahead and get things done, um, and they're not complacent and they're not entitled, um, and they're going to they they want to get things done and they 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 want to make a better life for themselves. Um, and what we're going to see uh, with with China for uh, for the first time that anyone can remember who is alive is an economy that is twice the size of the U.S., possibly three times the size of the U.S. It's going to be very weird living in that world. So uh, we, we better s- stop the infighting in the U.S. and stop punching ourselves in the face because, like, there's a whole, there's way too much, uh, you know, of, of America punching itself in the damn face, which is just dumb. Um, and and think about like, hey, we got to be competitive here. And and uh, there's a new kid on the block that's going to be t- two to three times our size. We we better step up our game. Um, and uh, you know, and stop infighting. Um, you think it's so, easier to stop infighting once we're beaten, or do you think that there's a way 
folks here can actually just, you know, get their political and commercial act together? But, or does it not happen until we realize we've lost? Or do we need a war? I, sure, I mean, I, we, I sure hope we don't need, we need a war. Um, uh, but but there, there will be certainly, um, you know, an, an economic competition that I think will, will blow people away um, and, and when they realize just how competitive they have to be to be competitive with companies in China. It's very difficult. Um, you know, Tesla is competitive but Tesla is competitive because we have an, an awesome team in China that, uh, you know, so. Um, like, do your Tesla China employees work some meaningful percentage more or harder than your Tesla non-China employees? Do you find like it's two different companies, basically? Well, I mean, for, I, I think te Tesla is somewhat, it, it, it Tesla is sort of pretty far out there in terms of work ethic uh, anywhere in the world. So I. Uh, to our, the Tesla work ethic in the U.S. I think is substantially greater than a, any other car company or or any large manufacturing company that I'm aware of. Um, so you know, t t Tesla Tesla does have a a, a strong work work ethic in in the U.S. But but to be totally frank, it it it, it the work that work ethic is exceeded. Um, uh, on balance by uh, t the t Tesla China team. That, that is, I think, objectively true. So there's not to say there aren't lots of hardworking people at Tesla US, there certainly are. Um, but if you say on average, the, the, the work ethic in China is higher. It's just, tell us, tell we're us calling, about calling it like it is, you know, so. What about if you're an American CEO? How do you deal with, do you think, just the, need for managing all these political factions inside of a company. You probably saw, you know, all the Sturm und Drang related to Disney and what happened to them and what's continuing to happen to them on both sides between their employees, as well as the governments, etc. cetera. Um, do you have any advice or what do you tell like young CEOs that you hang out with about how to deal with that, how to make those decisions, where you land in the spectrum of dealing with all of this stuff, the non-work issues that are related to now, you know, going to work every day. Uh, I'm not sure I entirely understand what you mean. Like, uh, you know, all the, I, all the, the, whether it's the, the need for political correctness or the need for having political points of view and having to bring that and balance that in the workplace. How do you deal with that? How do you give advice to other folks about having to deal with it? Look, I think it, you know, the, the, the point of a company is to produce useful products and services for your fellow human beings. It is not, uh, you know, some political gathering place or, a thing where it, that's the point of a company. Like it's, I'd say like it's, you know, politics and other stuff should. should <laughs> let's not lose sight of why companies should exist. <laughs> um, so I, and I, I, I got it. I got to I'm, I'm actually late for. Yeah. Of, I, I, apologize I gotta work on the rocket guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to go ahead and let you uh, get to Mars and uh, I'll see you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Elon Musk. Nicely done, brother. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sack. And I said, we open source it to the fans, and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, West. Ice Queen of King Wong. Be. Be. What? <laughs> we need to get merch. I'm doing all